Welcome back. This is how to DJ in Ableton Live Part 2. In the past video, I showed you guys how to set up Ableton to DJ. I showed you how to find the key of songs uh, musically or with the software mixed in key. And I showed you how to organize the songs. So um, let's get started on Part 2. Okay, so in this section, we're going to talk about how Ableton Live handles clips in the session view. And a clip is really just a, another name for a chunk of audio or a song. And it's what I have right here in my Library 1 and Library 2 channels. And if you remembered from the previous video, um, I showed you guys how to rename the songs. And um, now they're color-coded. And the way I'd color-coded them is just by right-clicking on the actual clip and just selecting a color from the menu here. It's pretty straightforward. And so these clips here um, are now represented by color and what genre they're, they belong to. And within a certain genre, usually music will stay within a certain BPM, which um, here in this section kind of it's housey or dance music um, and a little bit higher BPM. From 120 to 130, I'm going to say, is uh, what I would put here just to make sure that um, I don't go over or too, under too much in terms of the BPM for that set I'll be playing. And uh, on the right side is more down tempo stuff. Uh, it's probably like from 90 BPM to 100 BPM. So if I were to, to do like a down tempo style set of playing that sort of music for what, three or four hours, then I would want to make sure that these songs were within that BPM range from say 90 to 100 and then I would set my BPM up here globally uh, to match somewhere in the middle so for this dancier stuff I keep it at 125 which is a nice middle ground between 120 and 130 so that's a good way to organize your songs by BPM and then I have them in order uh, from lowest to highest on the harmonic uh, mixing scale and this is a uh, mixed in keys version of doing it I talked about that as well in the last video and so um, you know if, if I had three of these 1a files um, four of these 2a files I could pick and choose between any of those uh, as long as I go up or down um, the scale so if I went from 1a then I went to 2a then to 3a then to 3b obviously that would be fine and then I can go back if I wanted to um, obviously in a real world situation you'd be working with a lot more songs than this um, you can drop hundreds of songs in here if you'd like to and you can even separate them as well if you if you want so let's say I had a you know all my house songs went up to this channel right here and I had a little empty slot here and then I started a whole new set of songs and then I maybe color coded those and maybe it was uh, you know disco songs or something like that then they would all be uh, color coded appropriately so that's a little bit more on organizing clips. I'm not going to talk too much more about that because it's it's pretty straightforward and you can get a good idea of how I how I did it here. And um, so what we're going to talk about now is more the technical side of how Live deals with these clips. So I can double click on one and it's going to bring up the waveform editor, um, which you've seen in the past video where we were actually adding warp points to our songs. And if you remember, um, we've done them in increments of 16 bars. So one warp marker shows up every 16 bars. And that's a good way. You'll see later on how that works. But it's, it's a good way to keep um, musical changes throughout the song. So if usually in most dance music, something happens in measures of 4, 8, or 16. And you'll notice if you have them set up with 16, it can help a lot with blending music because you'll have a cue and you'll know when to trigger the next song and it'll make it'll make sense when you see it basically so this clip is open here now and you can see a little um, box down here that's a sample and it has a lot of different options in it and if I were to um, lower the volume of this clip per se let's say and uh, if you want to bring it down to like three decibel or something like that and you want to save that so now every time you drop this into Ableton it will be saved with that 3 dB or in this case 2.99 dB uh, you would just click the save button right here and what that's gonna do is Ableton will remember those changes you've made until you've made other changes and then you hit save again but for now it's at 3 dB we've hit save 
And now Ableton will always remember those changes. And it works for pretty much anything in this box here. So if I were to even lower the, the transposition of it and change the, the key of it, this is like pitch shifting basically, making the song higher or lower, um, you can actually save that as well. So all these different options here can be saved in the clip through Ableton Live. I'm just going to reset this to zero real quick. So saving clips is really important. Um, I don't really work too much with dragging files out of my file browser here and then dra dragging into my library. I like to have all my songs loaded in the library. That way I know that they're going to work and that Ableton's not going to do something funny and try to warp it you know, in real time. Even though, I've, I, in theory, you should warp your songs and then save it. Uh, but it, even then, it's still smart just to work with all the songs in your library. So it takes a lot of preparation and a lot of work, but if you can go through and get your all your songs organized in this way, you're going to have a much easier time when you're DJing. So it's really important to know that. So another thing I want to talk about is how Ableton handles the launching and stopping of your clips. Uh, to launch a clip, it's really simple. You just hit the play button right here. And to stop a clip, you would hit the stop button underneath it. Um, and the way that Ableton handles this is it will keep your clips in time. So if you hit the play button and launch a clip and then stop it, it will do it within musical increments. So right now, um, this is the global quantiz quantization menu up here, and it's set to one bar. So that means that I cannot stop a clip until or launch another clip until it's reached a bar. And this is much easier um, seen than it is explained. So I'll show you guys what I'm talking about here real quick. So these are bars right here. Here's one bar from one to two, and here's the second bar from two to three. That, that counts as one bar also. So I'm going to play the clip or launch the clip, and I'm going to hit the stop button, but I'm going to hit it when it's in between the three and the four here. And since this is in the middle of a bar, it's not going to stop it until it hits this four. So let me show you what I'm talking about here real quick. So I hit the stop button exactly in between the three and the four, but it didn't stop. So I'm going to go up here and I'm going to change this now to none. So that means I'm, I'm going to have complete control over when clips can be stopped or started. So I'm going to do the same thing again. I'm going to hit play and I'm going to stop it in between the three and the four and you'll see what's going to happen. So it stopped exactly when I hit the stop button. So you're probably wondering why does Ableton do this? Why does it keep you constrained like that? Well, the reason is because it keeps everything organized for you. So when you're going to launch a new clip, it will keep it in time with the previous clip. That way you're not launching it on an offbeat or something like that. It'll, it'll always be constrained to musical sense, basically. I mean, there, there's kind of no other way to put it. It just it makes musical sense the way Ableton does this. So I like to keep it on one bar for starting off with. And, uh, you know, if you want to mess around with it, you're free to. But if you're just starting off, you should just keep it on one bar. And that's usually the, the easiest way to, to get used to it. So... Uh, that's how Ableton handles launching the clips, and uh, we're going to talk about the the start marker as well here, real quick. Um, actually, it's this is this is something that can be kind of considered a cue point in DJ speak, if you want. Um, and a cue point was usually something they would use when you would have the vinyl, and then you would start it at a certain point, and you know that was going to be a drum break or it was going to be a, a a drop out of the song, and just a bass line would happen, and this this is kind of acts as a cue point. It's not really one, but you can use it that way. Um, you can't set up multiple cue points, unfortunately, so you're just stuck to this one. Um, and so you can basically set it up to where if you want it to start on a certain part of the song, then you can, and it'll always be there until you change it again. Um, so I think this looks like might be some kind of change in the song. I'll hit play real quick. <laughs> So it's pretty sparse there. So maybe if you had another track that was just drums that were louder, then you could blend the other track at that exact point to make them uh, work together. So it's good to keep in mind that you can set this play marker uh, wherever you'd like. And uh, most of the time, you probably want to have it uh, on one of the measure points here, like 11, 10, 9. Those are all different uh, areas for where the measures start and stop. So uh, it's a good idea to keep that in mind. Uh, usually when I'm 
working with basic DJing stuff, which I'm going to show you guys a little bit later. Um, usually I'll just start it from the beginning of the song because most of these tracks start with basic drums or, you know, minimal instrumentation and you can just blend it with the end of another track and they'll lock into each other and usually it works out pretty good. So I'll show you guys how to do that in a little bit. But first we're going to go over setting up effects and how to set up uh, deck A and deck B in Ableton. <laughs> 